Welcome back to our class on machine translation. Today's lecture is on phrase-based models. They used to be the state of the, of the art for about a decade until neural methods came around. This is what powered Google Translate to become popular. So uh, let's take a look at it. They also have the benefit of being relatively simple conceptually. So you'll understand how these models are learned and how powerful they are. Today we're going to look at how to build these models and the next lecture is on decoding with these models so this is uh, machine learning jargon would call this inference or maybe human beings would call this creating translations for an actual input so the motivation behind phrase-based models uh, is that the word-based models that we introduced in the last lecture uh, translates words as atomic units while phrase-based models translate phrases, and this has several advantages. One is that many-to-many -many translation, so you translate many words into many words, can handle non-compositional uh, phrases. So these are all these kind of idiomatic expressions, like it's raining cats and dogs, that if you pin it down to words, are really hard to explain. But uh, as phrases, you just memorize them. Um, it also has the benefit of using local context in translation. So a key feature to resolve the ambiguity of words, and we discussed this in the introductory lecture, um, is to look at the surrounding words. So actually translating a word with its surrounding words might actually help a lot in translating them. And the other advantage is that it's probably also a model that having more data is going to improve the model. In, in a kind of realistic sense, the more data you have, the longer phrases can be learned, and the limit, if you have infinite data, then you will memorize all sentence translations. So it kind of scales up pretty nicely with the data. So this is the standard model that was used again, will translate in others for more than a decade. So here it is. It's very simple, as I said. Um, so the idea is that we take the source sentence and break it up into phrases, and these are not linguistic phrases in any sense. So they have things like Spaß am could occur there, for instance. And um, then you have a one-to-one -one mapping between phrases from the source language to the target language. So each phrase has to produce a target phrase. Uh, so we don't have to deal with insertion and deletion and all the complicated things of the IBM models anymore. And, but there might also be reordering. So it's actually reordering could happen within a phrase, but that's already then captured by the phrase pair, so the model doesn't have to worry about it anymore. But also phrases themselves can be reordered. And that's pretty much it. Um, so here you see a couple of examples of where phrase-based models are kind of nice a solution for problems. We have this word natürlich, which translates into of course, so you have one word moving into two words. If you think about this in a word-based model, it's a bit hard to kind of reproduce. What does that mean? Does of get translate is a translation of natürlich and course also a translation of natürlich? Both of them are not really correct. Course usually means something else, and of is incredibly ambiguous. Another one here is the Spaß am, fun with her. So you have a, a noun that has a modifier, a modifying a prepositional phrase, and the kind of modifying prepositional phrase that a word like Spaß takes, well, it depends pretty much on that word Spaß, not so much on the noun in the prepositional phrase. So what kind of uh, uh, pronoun uh, preposition it takes here, which translates as with the, uh, M is actually a contract contraction of with the in German, um, it depends a lot on the word Spaß. So having that as a phrase translation is good too. Um, this is also a good example for when we talk about phrases, we, not, we don't mean linguistic phrases in a sense of a, what a syntax tree would call noun phrases, verb phrases, and so on. These are just any sequences of words. OK, so the key thing that has to be learned here is a phrase translation table. So you need to have a table like this for, for instance, the word natürlich, which translates as of course, naturally, of course, comma, comma, of course, comma, um, with the uh, different probabilities. So this looks a lot like a word translation table and really is 
uh, except it's on phrases now. By the way, our notation now is that phrases have a little bar on top. Yeah, the bar over the F apparently disappeared in the table. Um, so here's a bunch of other uh, examples of translations for a phrase. This is now a real example. So we took the German phrase den Vorschlag, uh, basically learned the phrases from the European Parliament corpus in a way we describe shortly. And these are the top translations. So you have the proposal, and that stands out pretty strikingly at 62% probability. And then this is the separated genitive uh, affix, uh, someone's proposal. That's still 10% pro probability. So proposals often belong to someone. A proposal, which is not quite correct given that this is a definite article, and here it's an indefinite article. And then you have some semantic variation uh, idea. Uh, you have plurals here, proposals here, also genitive snuck in. Uh, the motion, it's a suggestion. But you also have things like it here. And that's kind of interesting. Um, so this is a sentence, this comes from a sentence pair where in German, den Vorschlag repeated, was appeared, apparently it appeared before in previously sentences because in the English translation was good enough to just refer to it as it. So you have actually a difference in the way, what kind of information is in the German sentence and the English sentence, which makes sense in context and is fair in context. And there might actually be a good reason why in one language you use a, a pronoun to refer to it while in the other one you didn't. But it does create a problem for our phrase translation. So, on the other hand, this is kind of in the tail end, and there's actually a long, long tail of other stuff that kind of appears. And the advantage of, of statistical models is that this tail of the distribution really is not going to all matter all that much. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I already pointed out um, these phrases are not linguistic phrases. This is uh, one thing that caused a lot of confusion at the beginning when these were introduced because uh, linguists have very strong ideas about what a phrase is. By phrase, we mean things like noun phrases, verb phrases, prepositional phrases. We introduced these concepts earlier. Um, but we also have these things like Spaß am um, and fun with that. And these are very useful things. Often you have um, interest in is another one. I mean, there's a lot of kind of phrases where uh, you kind of connect up words that kind of belong together there. There are clearly syntactic relationships between them, but uh, they're not linguistic phrases in the traditional sense of linguistics. So one idea was, well, why does it learn all these strange phrases? Maybe you should just learn only linguistic phrases so we could limit it to linguistic phrases, but we found out that that actually hurts quality. So uh, even kind of features that promote linguistic phrases don't seem to have any benefit at all. Okay, so let's first talk about the model and then we'll talk about how we actually learn the phrases from the data. So the model, uh, we're still going to do uh, uh, probabilistic models with big translation probabilities. Um, this is also now finally the time to figure out how to combine that with a language model. And uh, for this, we use the base rule. So what we want to do is for a given foreign sentence, F here, um, theoretically, we consider all possible English sentences for it, any English sentence. And the probability distribution is going to give us a probability that any kind of arbitrarily chosen English sentence is a translation of that foreign sentence. So that's what this probability distribution uh, is doing. We are interested in the arc maxia. So we are interested in the E that maximizes probability. So in reality, we don't want to score all possible English sentences. We really just want to find the best translation for that foreign sentence. So. Um, that's the task, and uh, for some reason we apply the base rule, which becomes shortly clear. So this is just reformulating uh, this probability here into that 
that's just straight up base rule. Um, one thing we can do already to simplify it is because you're maximizing over E and the F is already always given. So we don't need, we, the probability of F doesn't really play a role when we find, try to find the maximum E because the only thing we vary is the E. So we can actually drop that out. So we can drop that out because we take the arc max. We don't actually interested in the computation of the probability. We just really try to find the arc max. Okay, that leaves us with two things. Um, uh, apparently still a translation model, except now it goes in the other direction. And more importantly, here is the language model. So this is a convenient way to introduce a language model. So there is some history behind this. This is called noisy channel model. So the noisy channel model comes from this metaphor. This was originally introduced in kind of telephone transmission, uh, how information goes through a channel and gets received. So there is a message that is sent out by someone that's the source, goes through a channel and someone receives the message. So, and of course you're trying to figure out what was that message. So what is the most likely message R that given what we just received through the channel is uh, most likely. So uh, the, way, the way we do this is we just say what messages are actually probable, what kind of things are being sent. So if the, we hear a word that, when, let's say just say through a telephone wire, we hear a word and there's a very common word uh, that it sounds like, and there's a really obscure word that it also sounds like, probably the more common word is more likely. Um, so that's the source. Um, in our case, that's the language model. And here is the channel model. So this is the probability how a source gets um, kind of disrupted or confused or noised up by the channel. And maybe we actually can come up with better models how noise is being produced from clean signal than the other way around. So, um, so in our case, again, uh, so we, obs we observe a distorted message R. So this is our foreign string. So this is what we get. Someone actually really wanted to say something English, but somehow it came out as French. So we hear that French sentence. So that's what we have. We have a French string. Um, we have a model how the message is distorted. So this is our translation model. And we also have a model what messages are probable. That's our language model. Um, so we want to recover the original message as here, the English string E. So if you just compare these with the properties on the previous slide, you can actually get the same formulation. Okay, um, a bit more detail. So uh, kind of repeating this. So we are interested in the best translation, which is this arc max. So the E then maximizes this probability and we reformulate that as the probability of the foreign sentence given the English sentence and the probability of the language model. So we have a language model, a translation model, and we have a language model. And uh, how are we going to do this? So the language model, we, we talked about endlessly uh, a week ago. And the translation model was, uh, we, we're going to break up the following way. So this is now a phrase-based model. So the idea is that the sentence F is broken down into a sequence of phrases. So if I, big I, number of phrases. So the number of I is the same for the number of English phrases and foreign phrases, because we have one-to-one -one mapping between phrases. And uh, so we're just gonna score now each phrase given the, here now probably a foreign phrase given the English phrase, we score each foreign phrase, how likely it's a mapping of the English phrase. Again, this is, the inverse of the actual translation direction due to the noisy channel model. Um, so this is very similar to the IBM model one that you just when you have to explain each uh, foreign phrase here now, given an English phrase. And then we have a distortion model. So this is a very simple way of putting it. And that's one of the core kind of uh, um, Reordering models, we're going to count more complicated reordering models soon. 
So this just kind of gets like, which word does the phrase start and which word did the previous state phrase end? This is now all counted over the English phrases. And uh, what difference? And uh, just minus one is just, usually this should be start minus end of the previous should be one. So if you distract, subtract one, this gives zero. So if there's no movement, then uh, that is a zero. If there's movement, this is a higher number and you're gonna kind of take this number and, and convert it to some kind of reordering probability. Here's explicitly what we're gonna do. So here's a foreign sentence and we map it into English. And uh, basically for each foreign phrase, we can now check how much it was reordered. So we first translate this here. So for that, we start at the beginning so, and we expect it to be starting at the beginning. So there's no reordering. Now we're going to do, uh, now we translate um, this here next. And uh, there we suddenly, you know, jumped two words. And this is what's indicated here. We jumped over two words. So there's a distance of two. We jumped forward two words. Then we make up for it when we go here and go back. And here now we go back three steps. So this, this is influenced by how much we jumped earlier, but also how long this phrase is. So if this would be a two word phrase, then actually it would be jumping back forwards. So this is minus three. And then finally we're here and uh, uh, this is what we just translated. So when we didn't translate the last phrase, we jump exactly here again, one word. And this is what we kind of compute as distances. So what do we do with that? Well, we actually have a very simple scoring function. We're going to come up with some kind of alpha. Um, we're kind of doing away with the idea that this is actually a probability distribution at this point. Um, so this alpha is just some kind of factor that kind of penalizes reordering and what that alpha is set to uh, is uh, somewhat arbitrary. We cannot actually come up with methods how to set this very smartly. Okay, that's the model. So where do we get all these things from? So last time we did all these fairly sophisticated EM algorithm. Um, we here may mostly just piggybacking off that work. So the task is to learn a model from a parallel corpus. There are three stages. There's word alignment. So we're using IBM models or other methods. So basically what we just talked about in the last lecture. And then we extract phrase pairs and then we have to score them. So uh, keep in mind this uh, idea of word alignment that we had. Um, so uh, if you still remember, there's some really unambiguous things like Michael translating as Michael. Um, then there are phrasal stuff, geta von aus becomes assumes, that's still fine. There's things like what do we do with commas, maybe there's some argument about that. Um, and, and so on and so on. Here im becomes in the, so you have phrases uh, that are longer either in English or in German. Here you have a German word mapping to two English words. Here you have an English word mapping to three German words. And that's all fine. So that's the word alignment. And then we extract phrases from it. So actually each of these black blocks already is a phrase translation, but we also want to have bigger phrases. So we also draw bigger boxes. So this is now a bigger box here in gray that creates a translation for assumes that Gita von now does. So this is um, now a longer phrase and we want to have that in our phrase table as well. We want to have as long phrases as possible kind of a lot of local context helps with disambiguation and all the good things. So here is the uh, principle we're going after. So basically we want to draw boxes like this and um, they have to contain alignment points. So they have to contain at least one alignment point. And uh, whatever alignment points, whatever words they kind of correspond with, have to have their alignment points inside the box. So if you draw this box here, uh, we're now talking about these words here and these words here, 
but then all the alignment word points for these words have to be inside the box and here uh, we have one word that the one alignment point that's outside the box so this is violated this is something we don't do um, one ambiguous thing too is also what do you do with unaligned words so here you have a word that has no alignment point at all and that can be attached then to the phrase as well so it's fine to have unaligned words also at the boundaries Um, if you want to have a mathematical definition, this is here. So we're talking about phrase pairs, English, foreign, foreign um, that are consistent with the alignment A. And that's the definition here. So for all the English words in the English phrase, uh, all the alignment points that exist for that English word, um, there has to be the foreign word also in the foreign phrase. Um, this is just the inverse of that. And finally, this just says there has to be, there has to exist at least one English word and foreign word in the alignment. So what does that mean in practice? Let's just play this through. So the smallest phrases you can extract are these here. So these are just the blocks. So basically each block here corresponds to one phrase. Um, so we have... Uh, assumes being this phrase here. Then uh, we extract bigger phrases. So these are now also neighboring blocks. So Michael assumes, so this is Michael assumes, and that has to be mapped to all of this here. And that's this phrase here. And we kind of keep doing this. So we're also going to get bigger and bigger ones. Uh, so the question is, where do you stop? Do you want to have gigantic phrases? And uh, uh, in practice, there is limited benefit in having really gigantic phrases. So maybe you're just going to impose a word length limit of, say, seven words or five words. So you have now a bunch of these phrases. So this is just, you can go over each sentence pair and it dumps out all these phrase pairs, you can extract all these phrase pairs from it. How do we score them? Well, we're just gonna do the maximum likelihood estimation we always do. So we just score by relative frequency. So given uh, account for a foreign phrase, um, uh, English phrase translating into a foreign phrase, we're gonna look at all the other ways this English phrase can be translated into foreign phrases. So all the other possible foreign phrases that the English phrase translates to. So this is the total, also the total number of the English phrase occurring in phrase pairs. And that gives us a probability distribution here, which we call phi for phrase. There, uh, what we just described is a very fairly heuristic setup to build phrase translation tables. Might come across as a bit hacky and not beautiful mathematically. We just have this beautiful EM algorithm. Um, so it's actually possible to also apply the EM animal algorithm to align phrase pairs directly. So we basically do the same kind of thing. So initialize, first all phrase pairs are the same, then the expectation step, you kind of look at all the possible phrase alignments for sentence pair, and then the maximization step, you collect counts and so on. So you basically kind of play through the entire EM algorithm as well. Um, however, this model, if you actually run this, it actually tends to overfit. It learns really long phrase pairs spanning entire sentences. So if you just run the AM algorithm, since it can learn arbitrarily short and long phrases, what it ultimately going to learn is that this sentence pair, yeah, whenever you see this sentence, that sentence is the most likely translation with 100% probability. Um, that's a fairly low perplexity model, um, zero entropy cross entropy. So uh, it's kind of natural that that's the endpoint, and therefore this is not a really good algorithm. So you have to do something else about it. You somehow have to penalize long phrases or you terminate early. Uh, so there were some attempts, but this was pretty much abandoned this idea. So, um, so the phrase tables are typically bigger than the corpus. Um, you already saw on the previous example from a single sentence pair, you get a lot of stuff. Um, even if you put limits on phrase length, so let's say maximum seven words, 
and more recently we just put in a limit of five words so then it becomes too big to store into memory uh, so you have to do all kinds of tricks to do this um, so one is um, a training time to do it on disk by just basically saving everything on disk and then do, doing disk operations decoding time um, there's also a problem of uh, speed and look up and people came up with very very fancy data structures that, that index things um, there was also the idea of using suffix array to create phrase pairs on demand so you just store the corpus and the word alignment when you come across a sentence you then go out and estimate first translation probabilities and that actually was surprisingly fast okay so this was the basic model um, so next we'll go over some of the more advanced modeling choices that were made. So the first thing that uh, was changed was the idea of a weighted model. So the model, the kind of standard model that I introduced con consists of three sub models. So we have phrase translation probabilities. We have this reordering model and uh, which was already not really a probabilistic model a language model and uh, if you just spell it all out this is kind of how it looks like so we have argmax over e sentence e we might try to find the best sentence e given well here's the decomposition over phrase pairs and you have the phrase translation probability the reordering and we multiply all that. So if you want to think about parentheses, there's one big parenthesis here and one big parenthesis here. Um, that's the language model where we, we, ha we have to explain each English word given the preceding ones. And uh, the actual language model is going to, of course, it cut down the history there. So some of these submodels are more important than others. So this is, a, for instance, a big open question. What is more important? Is the language model important or the translation model more important? We already talked about this a little bit in the introduction, and there might actually be, you know, in some cases, the language model more important. It's more important to produce fluent output than being super accurate, literally. Well, in other cases, it's much more important that all the information is preserved as cleanly and as accurately as possibly, even if it that makes somewhat hobbled English text. So it would be nice if you could add weights for them. So let's call these lambda. So for each of these models, we're going to have a weight. And the way this works out mathematically, that for each probability that comes, we take it to the power of that weight. So uh, if the weight is 1, the probability is unchanged. If it's 2, then any kind of differences in that probability distribution uh, is going to be quite radically expanded. So such a weighted model, um, we can also write it as a log linear model if we uh, work with log, pro log space. And there's several reasons to work on log space. One is if you multiply all these probabilities, you multiply a lot of small numbers. At some point, you get underflow in your math. And they're just generally nasty to look at. So we just work with logs. So we take the log of the language model. We actually already had examples of that when we looked at language model um, scores and uh, the whole perplexity computation, um, the log of the distortion model, the log of the phrase translation model. So when these are all logs, then um, the weights become factors. So if you would actually do that mathematically, uh, any kind of thing that goes up here, if you take the log, then becomes a factor down here. Um, so in this case, uh, we have three features, these three features, and um, yeah. So we have um, features and weights for them, and we weight them. And to make them prob probabilities, we could now take um, a reverse that log operation by taking the exponent of that. But in practice, we don't actually care about the actual probability. Uh, so um so our 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 weighted model for the phrase based model as a log linear model looks like this this is just kind of filling in all the kind of gory details uh so these are our weights and these are our actual formulations of each of these model components 
So uh, I think it's worth pointing out this decomposes pretty nicely. So you have here one kind of expression for the phrase translation model, here have one expression for the distortion model, and here have one expression for the language model. So these can be all computed independently of each other, and then each of them provides a score. Okay. Um, okay, so this is now, we have three features, we can weight them, or why stop there? Why don't we just have more features? Um, and there's a bunch more features that are commonly used in these models. So one is motivated by this problem that rare phrase pairs have unreliable phrase translation probability estimates. And why is that? Well, if a phrase only occurs once, then its translation, whatever it's mapped to also, is only there once. And uh, so you have one to one. So in terms of maximum likelihood estimation, this gives you 100% probability. So for any rare phrase, we are super certain about its translation, which is not exactly what we want, because anything that occurs once is definitely a bit dubious. So what do we do? Well, maybe we should also still use the lexical weighting with word translation probabilities. So we're still going to do the word to word mapping. So we basically going to compute how likely is assumes a translation of gate, how likely is not a translation of nicht and so on and so on. And uh, so here you have to deal with uh, the problem that we have many to many word alignments. So you can just use plainly IBM model one. Although there are also versions of phrase based model where they just use straight up IBM model one. Um, so here it's done a little bit more sophisticated where we have to still explain each English word. But if there are multiple English words, then basically we average them. So this is just averaging over the possible English word translations. So in this case here, assumes is explained by uh, three different words. Um, and uh, so assumes is translate is by gate the F1 hours. So these are the ones that we sum over here. These are all the different foreign words we're summing over here. So each gives a probability. So maybe assumes gate, that's still probably pretty high, and assumes step one, maybe low, and assumes hours, maybe low. Anyway, we're adding up all these word translation probabilities. So here we're just adding them up, but then we divide by three here by the number of of those uh, different word translation probabilities. So we're averaging over them. Um, each English word has to be explained. So does, which doesn't actually have correspondence in English, has to be then explained by the null word. Uh, okay, let's not stop there. More feature functions. So the language model has a bias towards short translations. And why is that? Well, because fewer words in a sentence means fewer probabilities multiplied up. So uh, what can we do instead? We just uh, also have a word count feature that counts how many words we produce. So we're just going to basically take the length of the sentence and uh, say we're going to prefer shorter sentences over longer sentences, or longer sentences over shorter sentences, depending on which weight we give this word count feature. Maybe we can give it a negative weight saying we want to produce a lot of words. So more words um, reduces than the cost of the translation. Another one might be how many phrases are we using? Maybe we prefer a model that actually uses large phrases or that more uses the short phrases. So we count up how many phrases are being used. Um, what's other, always done is multiple language models, multiple translation models, or any other knowledge sources. So this is pretty much becomes like a toolbox where you can throw in any kind of feature. And as long as you can efficiently compute it during decoding, um, it's fair to throw it in and try it out. Okay, let us take another look at reordering. So in the spirit of what we just said before, we can introduce additional feature functions. And one area where the models are rather weak is reordering, or we have is some kind of penalty where the model doesn't like to reorder. But for certain language directions, there's just very systematic reordering that happens, and maybe we should you know, allow it and encourage the same thing. This kind of it reordering is actually super common, so you shouldn't penalize it with a distortion limb cost. So the idea is to 
um, condition reordering on the words involved. So therefore it's called lexicalized reordering. So we start at the beginning of a sentence. So the way you read this is in a typical uh, word uh, alignment matrix. So um, here are the English sentences we produce. So we produce one or two words or three words each time. And these are the foreign source words. And uh, at the beginning, we're here. We haven't produced any English words yet. And we would expect to start at the beginning of the foreign sentence as well. And this is what we do here. So this is then called monotone. So we have a monotone mapping. Next one, you would expect to then move on to the sec second foreign word. And that's what we do here. We move to the second foreign word. But then in this sentence pair here, something interesting happens. And suddenly we, we jump here. I would have expected to continue here, but what we're doing is we continue here instead. So this is a is D. This, this is called discontinuous. Um, and then we basically jump back. Um, we could call this also discontinuous, but in this case we actually call this a sort of special case, which is a swap, because we end now at the point where the previous phrase started. So we really just uh, uh, completed a swap of these two phrase pairs. And therefore, we treat that slightly differently. So we call it a swap. And then the last one is, again, uh, uh, discontinuous. Also, there are some versions where that last thing here is called um, um, monotone, because after we completed that swap here, we actually, you know, you would expect to continue right there. Uh, there's a version called hierarchical lexical reordering model where the kind of hierarchy of, of these uh, phrases is taken into account. So how do you learn this? It's actually pretty straightforward. Whenever you extract a phrase pair, uh, so let's say we extract this phrase pair here during training, uh, all we have to check is, is the alignment point to the top left here? If there's alignment point to the top left here, then this is a monotone occurrence of this phrase pair. If there's a line point up here, it's a swap. And if neither of these, if there's no alignment point in either of these, then it's discontinuous. So, and then we're back to the very common maximum likelihood estimation. Um, one thing we do is we smooth this uh, a little bit. Um, there might be phrase pairs that never occur in particular orientations. So they're never swapped or they're never discontinuous. I mean, singleton phrase pairs only occur in one orientation. So we have to smooth that a little bit. So we also have a uniform distribution over orientations. So we take the actual kind of count-based estimation, which we kind of do with the usual maximum likelihood uh, estimation, and we add to it uh, uh, a, a smooth, um, just unconditioned uh, orientation model. Okay, one last refinement. This is actually the, the last real big kind of improvement to phrase-based models, what's called uh, operation sequence model. Um, it might actually also address some of the concerns you might have had while listening to the presentation of phrase-based models. So um, here's a critique of phrase-based models. So the segmentation we do in phrases is completely arbitrary. So if multiple segmentations are possible, why do we choose one over the other? And uh, how this is actually done during inference time, we'll talk about uh, in the next lecture. But at modeling time, we just consider all of them. But yeah, why why do we choose one over the other? And uh, that's pretty arbitrary. We're actually going to choose the one that gives us higher probabilities at the end. Um, also, should we choose uh, rather in our model to use small phrases or large phrases? So should we just a lot of small phrases or maybe one big large phrase or something in between? Um, all this is kind of left up 
to the model and it seemed to be mostly doing the right thing but none of this actually has really been properly addressed um, the only thing vaguely resembling an idea of addressing this of what i talked about so far was to have a phrase count feature so phrase count feature might then prefer shorter or longer phrases to be used on average uh, the model also has a very strong independence assumption so yes uh, we have this nice benefit of considering lexical context within a phrase pair but we don't actually looking at any context outside the phrase pair so whatever occurs here or here uh, maybe the decision of this determiner uh, of this preposition and determiner com combination here is uh, is very dependent on what the next word is and actually it is the case in german because this already implies a certain gender for the noun that follows but we don't know what that noun is so so what's the solution to that um, so here's the first step um, so that seems to be going in the wrong direction which is the idea of let's just break things down into minimal phrase pairs so just let's interpret interpret this model in, in terms of minimal phrase pairs so the thing that happens changes here is well for instance this here we can't really change um, that's uh, one word we can break up one word but here you have two words here and three words there and we can actually break that up into smaller pieces so this is just looking at the word alignment within phrase pairs and just says, can we break it up into smaller pieces? It doesn't necessarily have to end up as one-to-one -one mappings most of the time or one-to-two mappings. It still could have two-to-two -two mappings if there's some, some funky alignment going on. So, and uh, the next, so this just kind of reduces context. And now we try and sneak in context back again. And we're actually gonna do this in a little bit more complicated way than you would think. So we basically look at the sequence of operations that we do. And the operations we talk about uh, so far is translation operations. So we call them generate here. So this is a sequence of the generate operations. So naturally, of course, John, John has had naturally, of course, I'm with. It might also have insertion of words here the, with the uh, so this is allowed here too. This happens kind of when you break up the phrase pairs into smaller units. Maybe there's just underlined words and they just then spill out as generate target only. Um, what is added to that is also these um, reordering operations. So, uh, well, if you break it up into a sequence of operations, why not just really go overboard and, put, and insert everything, not just uh, the phrase mappings, these minimal phrase mappings now, but also the reordering. So this is kind of the translation process broken down into a sequence of operations. So we have here now the, the sequence of operations um, going down 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06. So this is just a sequence of operations. So the whole translation is the sequence of operations. So the operations could be generate, so these are phrase translations, generate target only, generate source only, which is really a deletion step, insert gap, jump forward, jump forward jump backwards you could actually really just do this from scratch and learn these operations from raw data and not even see this as a refinement of phrase-based models and there actually has been work on that these were called n-gram translation models um, in our case though what these operations are pretty much follows out of if we do a regular phrase-based translation process um, we just kind of take each phrase pair then while we use it and break it up into the operations that are implied, including any kind of reordering that might happen. Okay, so you have a sequence of operations. So keep this here in mind. You have a sequence of operations. So this is what we're talking here about. You have a sequence of operations. So now we're doing an n-gram model over this sequence of operations. 
So what's the probability that a translation starts with operation number one? What's the probability that the second operation follows that first operation? What's the probability of the third operation following the first two operations? And so on. And here we're having a five gram model. So when we come down to the tenth operation, we consider we condition it on the previous four, O six, O seven, O eight, O nine. So uh, you very clearly going to have some flashbacks on language modeling here. And you're using exactly the same technology for this. But this is now applied on the operations that are implied by the process of phrase translation. So in practice, uh, what seems to work really well is to use this operation of sequence model as a additional feature functions. Uh, it had significant improvements over phrase-based models and uh, the state-of-the-art phrase-based systems included such a model. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, so we talked about the phrase-based models, how to train it. Um, we didn't have a nice, beautiful EM algorithm. We talked about EM training for phrase-based models, but it was more like a hacky solution based on, given the word alignment, we extract phrases and score them. Then we introduced this idea of a log linear model. Um, so uh, the idea is that the, the model that we defined first fairly mathematically with Bayes rule and all kinds of arguments, we now uh, break it up into um, a bunch of uh, individual component, the language model, the translation, phrase translation model, a lexical translation model, a, le a reordering model, a lexicalized reordering model, the operation sequence model, and so on. Even with the phrase translation model in the source direction into the target direction in actually both directions and the same with lexical and so on and so on and so on. So we have a bunch of feature functions and they can be combined in a log linear model and uh, uh, then there are ways to optimize the weights. Um, we talked about the lexical ordering model and operator sequence model as uh, refinements to a phrase based, um, the generic phrase based model. So. So this should give you an idea that, okay, this is a mechanism that gives us a bunch of probability tables, but how do you actually translate with that? And that's the topic for next lecture.